Hi, my name is John Shepard, and I'm going to be telling you all about the changes that the emergency medical system in Virginia Beach saw over the span of COVID. Uh, everybody uh, was affected by COVID in one way or another. I know some people were affected more than others. Some people lost loved ones. Other people were working in it. Some people lost their job in it. But I'm just going to be going into some of the changes that we saw in the medical system uh, in the field in Virginia Beach. Uh, one of our first big changes was we saw changes to our protocols, more specifically uh, what we could and could not use. To start out with, we were told that we could no longer use the CPAP because it caused a greater risk to infection for the crew members and the other healthcare professionals that may be taking care of this patient. It was considered an aerosolizing procedure, and therefore, we could not administer it with patients. Uh, our next big change that we saw was nebulizers, because nebulizers are also a big um, aerosolizing procedure. The nebulizer kind of looks like this. We give this to patients when we're trying to give them medications. The medication goes in this portion right here. We put the medication there, we screw on the top, and we attach this to oxygen, which then disperses the medication, and the patient breathes it in here. The issue is they also breathe it out here, and with the medication coming out, that is also COVID that they're breathing into the air. This uh, and the CPAP machine, it was very controversial to not be able to use these because they are also items that we use to help with respiratory patients. And as many of you know, COVID is a very respiratory disease. So this is something that could help, but it could also hurt other people at the same time. And so in that case, uh, the people who made our medical decisions uh, made the decision that the safety of the majority, unfortunately, was bigger than the safety of one. So we had to come up with other ways. In most cases, that meant we had to go ahead and intubate, which would normally be a last resort, now became the first thing you would do rather than using this. The last thing was we have a machine called the Lucas machine. This is an automatic CPR machine that does amazing things. We used to only be able to put it on once we did 10 minutes of manual compressions and that changed during COVID. Now we could put it on as soon as we get on, got on scene. Really that didn't change um, too much for the provider. It actually helped us out a little bit. However, uh, the decision was made to do that because it would limit the exposure to providers. When you have manual compressions, you have to switch out compressors every two minutes. And so that means that for as long as you're working a cardiac arrest, you have to add more and more people in. When you do that Lucas machine, that takes it down. So now you don't have to have those people doing compressions. You only have to have one person controlling the airway, one person controlling the uh, medications that are being given to the patient, and one person uh, working the life pack for rhythm changes and such. So that cut down on the number of people being exposed, so we no longer had to worry about that exposure. Our next item that we had saw major changes in, our major topic, was our procedures. Um, we do, we have lots and lots of procedures uh, that tell us how we're supposed to, the protocols teach us how we're supposed to teach, how we're supposed to treat the patient. However, the procedures tell us more, uh, give us guidelines of what we're supposed to do on scene. Not necessarily medically, but uh, the first big change for that was we adopted what we called EMS-5. This was a dispatch liaison. It was a chief that went and sat in the 911 dispatching center who would do what we call triaging calls. So the pay, so you would call 911 and the call taker would take your information and the EMS-5 liaison 
would listen to the call and then advise on exactly how many units needed to be sent and if they could downgrade the response or send less units that way there was not a there was not more people exposed than they needed to if it was a covid call or if it wasn't a covid call they wanted to try to keep as few personnel exposed as possible that way when we we brought it back to the we wouldn't bring it back to the station and that way if somebody did get covid it would be a select few that ended up being pulled out rather than an entire fire company or EMS station. The next thing that we saw major changes in, as I'm sure most people did in multiple different jobs, is we saw changes to our PPE. So we started out with surgical masks, I'm sure most people are used to seeing by now, and then we upgraded all the way to half-face respirators that we had to wear with COVID patients. Uh, since then, we've actually gone back down to surgical masks, but during that peak, this is what we had to wear for 12 hours at a time uh, unless we were outside by ourselves in the open air. And the last thing, which was kind of unfortunate, and now we're really seeing the effects of it, was we couldn't have students on our ambulances anymore. In the past, students were able to come and ride on the ambulance. That way they could get the experience and we were no longer able to have students ride on the ambulance. This really affected how many EMTs we were able to put out into the field. And now we're definitely seeing staffing really low. And so some of our nights can get pretty hectic. But those are some of the major changes we saw on the ambulance and with our protocols and procedures. I hope this was some good information for y'all. And now in the speech to the classes where I'd take uh, more any questions that anybody had.